Hey everybody, it's Mike over at Taxes and Bricks. <clears throat> Welcome to episode 59. Uh, and it is Mailbag Friday. Woohoo! Alright, so uh, this week I really only got one question that I haven't really addressed in great detail uh, in a past episode, and it is a question about 1031 exchanges or tax free exchanges. We've brought them up a couple of times. I've mentioned a few little facts and details here and there, but nothing really super in depth. So, I'm going to take a quick breather here and pay the lawyers, and we'll be right back. And I'm going to run through the question I got and my response. This video is rated TAX and contains occasional ramblings, mild attempts at humor, self-deprecation, irreverence, brief numerical examples, and adult tax and accounting advice that may not be suitable for all taxpayers. Viewer discretion is advised. Before following any of the advice in this or any of our videos, you should always consult with a tax professional. Thank you. All right, thanks for hanging in there for that disclaimer. So this week's question came in. It was about 1031 exchanges and basically came in from a client who lives overseas, has been overseas working uh, for about 10 years. Um, before they moved overseas, they were living in a house that they had bought a few years prior as a primary residence. And they got this opportunity to go overseas and they decided to hang on to this property because there was a lot of investment potential and they had spoken with the people that they knew and trusted who said that they could generate a lot of rental income. They talked to me about it and we determined that there would be little to no tax every year on the rent that they collected because um, you know, of various different expenditures that they were gonna have and they were still gonna have positive cash flow, but because of the depreciation deduction, there was basically gonna be no tax every year or no profit. So. Here we are today, 10 years later, time to sell. So they're gonna sell. So the question was, does their house qualify for a 1031 exchange? Uh, what do they need to buy in order to make this uh, you know, a correct legal exchange? So they wanna buy something else now. Um, you know, They wanna keep being a real estate investor because it worked out so well for them. Um, and then are there any other pieces of information they might know? So um, I think before we jump into answering the question for you, I want to define what a 1031 exchange is and give you some information on it um, because I think that it's important before we jump in and just start talking about it that you kind of understand. So 1031 exchanges apply to rental properties and really rental properties only these days. Um, and basically it's a process by which you take a rental property that you own and you sell it. And then within a certain amount of days, you purchase another rental property of you know equal or greater value to the sales price of the property that you're selling and we'll explain that in a second too um and if you do so in a certain amount of days and you do so with a certain uh you know following of certain rules then the government allows you to exclude the gain from the sale of your original property from your tax return and if you're excluding the gain that means you're also not paying any tax at least short term, okay? Possibly long term, because we'll explain why in a little bit. Okay, so 1031 exchange. It's basically a real estate strategy to allow you to sell a property, pick up another one, both of which have to be rental properties, and not pay any taxes, okay? Or defer your taxes, depending on your situation. Okay, so getting to sort of the meat of the question, my client wanted to know whether or not his property qualified. Why was he asking whether it qualified? Well, it started off life as a, as a primary residence and it went 10 years as a rental property. He wants to know if that qualifies. The answer is yes, it does. Because for the most part, it's been a rental property. Um, but certainly for the last several years, it's been a rental property. I think that's the litmus test upon which we apply it. So if we can't use you know, some kind of a primary residence test or exclusion where it's been a primary residence long enough to have an exclusion of tax there, which would be the better option, um, because you wouldn't have to buy another rental property if you didn't want to, um, then, we, then we use the rental property test and this passes the rental property test, no problem. So good, all day, this qualifies. What does he have to buy? Well, one of the rules with a 1031 exchange is the property you buy has gotta be located inside the United States of America. I'm not gonna get into what inside the United States of America means if you don't know, I don't know. So, 
This property qualifies. What he buys has got to be in the U.S. He can't buy something located in Europe where he happens to be living. Okay. Um, other things that he needed to know and, and that you should know about 1031 exchanges. Um, you need to hire a qualified intermediary. Okay. That's the first thing you're going to want to probably do. Um, so what's a qualified intermediary? A qualified intermediary is an individual that is going to help oversee the 1031 exchange process. They are going to help you identify um, or at least record the identification of the properties that you might want to buy after you sell your original property, okay? They're going to uh, record all the timing for everything and keep records of it. And they're also gonna hold all of the money from the sale of your original property. This is important because part of the rules of 1031 exchanges is you can't lay your hot little hands on any of the cash from the sale of your original property, okay? It's gotta be held with a third party, that qualified intermediary, all right? Um, and that's part of it because you aren't constructively receiving any of the money from the sale. And that's how I guess in theory, they kind of say physically we're saying you didn't actually profit, okay? Um, and so that's kind of a good way to kind of justify it in your head. You actually didn't receive any of the money. How can you pay taxes on money you didn't receive? There you go, okay. Um, kind of simplistic, but a good way to look at it. All right, hire a qualified intermediary. Then you put your house on the market you know, this DC house that my client owns, and sell it, all right? And then within 45 days of the sale of your existing rental property, you have to provide the qualified intermediary of a list of at least one, but really you wanna do more than one um, in general, more than one properties that you might like to purchase, okay? Um, at the end of that 45 days, you can't add to that list though. So if you only identify one property, all right, and it falls through because someone else comes in and buys it, well, sorry about your luck. You, you, you're, you're cooked. The end of the 45 days is over and you're done. You, you can't identify more properties. You go, whoopsie. See, again, hard and fast deadlines here. Um, can't break them, can't extend them, can't do anything. That 45 days ends. If you don't have a property that you've identified that you could physically close on, you're done, okay. There's another time test that comes up and it also starts the day you sell your original property. It doesn't start at the end of the first 45 days. It starts simultaneously on the same day that you sell your property. So the 45 day clock starts running. So does this 180 day clock. What's the 180 day clock? The 180 day clock says you have 180 days from the sale of your original property to buy one of the properties on that list that you provided inside the first 45 days. So now I think you're starting to see if you put one property down and 45 days expires, and then, you know, 120 days later, your deal falls through, sorry about your luck. You're out of, you're out of luck. You're way outside the 45 days and you didn't get that one property. So it's good to kind of hedge your bets and, and maybe put, three, five, seven, 20,000 properties on the list, okay? Um, that 180 days, by the way, is also not an extendable deadline. Neither the 45 days nor the 180 days is extendable at all, okay? Um, how long does the rental property that you buy have to remain a rental property after you effect a proper exchange? I say two years, at least, okay? Uh, at the end of two years, I mean, you can sell it, you can move back into it. You could, I guess, convert it to a second home if you wanted to, something like that. But ultimately, two years, and that should satisfy everything. Some people say one year. I've seen that. I don't know. Eh, it's kind of iffy. I'm really more a fan of the two-year mark. But, you know, if your accountant says one year, your accountant can justify a year, fine. I like two years. But, you know, again, that's just me. Longer the better, as far as I'm concerned. Um, all right, so um, what are some of the other uh, rules with 1031 exchanges? Do you have to buy a property that um, costs more or less than the property you sell? Well, I think we've said the property that you purchase has got to cost uh, the same amount or um, 
more than the sales price of the property you sell. So for example, let's say I'm selling a rental property um, in DC and I'm selling it for $750,000, then the property that I purchase in order to exchange uh, and do this 1031 exchange, it's gotta be 750,000 or more. But can I buy something cheaper? Yes, you can. You can buy something cheaper, but you're gonna have what's called a partial exchange and then you're gonna have to pay some taxes on gain. So just be aware that if you are buying you know, a cheaper property than the one you're selling because you do wanna pocket some cash because like, hey, you wanna have some fun with your money, great, just be aware there's gonna be some tax implications. Can you sell one property and buy multiple properties as the replacement? Yes, you can. In the same way, by the way, that you could sell multiple rental properties in a year and purchase one property. But again, you gotta pay attention to the costs and the value. So if like you're selling 10 rental properties for you know 10 million bucks, you're gonna have to find one property that costs $10 million that you're gonna rent out if you want this to be a proper exchange. Probably not a realistic example, but illustrates the point. So um, that's kind of, I would say it's it with 1031 exchanges. I mean, every situation's you know, gonna be a bit different and, and a bit special here. Um, you know, and, and you're gonna definitely wanna hire a real estate agent who understands and knows 1031 exchanges. You're definitely gonna wanna make sure if you've got financing issues where you're gonna have to acquire financing to pick up that replacement property, that it's ironclad and it's a sure thing or it's, it's pretty certain because if financing prevents you from acquiring that replacement property, it's not like you can go to the IRS and be like, oh, I couldn't get it because my mortgage wouldn't go through. Can I have an extension? No, 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 and that's just the way it is. Um, so a lot of things to consider here. Um, you know, a real estate agent's gonna tell you how realistic it is to purchase a property that you might have on your list. Um, so real estate agent, good resource. Somebody who's been working with 1031 exchanges before, same thing with a lender, things like that. You wanna make sure you hire a really good qualified intermediary, somebody who's been in business for a long time, somebody who's trustworthy, somebody who's gonna be transparent, they're gonna be holding an awful lot of your money. So you wanna do your due diligence and make sure they're good. Um, you know, using somebody that um, you know who's been used before by somebody that you know, um, you know, somebody who maybe has some kind of a license or bond or insurance or something like that. Um, I, I heard a horror story about a 1031 exchange intermediary who absconded with the money. And while well, that person got in a whole lot of trouble, the 1031 exchange didn't go through and the taxpayer was basically on the hook. Cause again, even though the intermediary stole the money and they didn't go to closing, the IRS wouldn't give the person an extension because they couldn't get to closing because there was no money to go to closing with. Um, so anyway, probably more horror stories than anything else, but you just want to do your due diligence if you're thinking about doing this. So uh, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. A uh, little mailbag on the go here. Hope you enjoyed today's episode, found it informative. Uh, go ahead and like, subscribe. Don't forget to share content with your friends and have a great day.